Hello and welcome to Real to Real. Today we are visiting St. Peter and St. Casimir Parish in Westfield, a parish named after its two founding parishes, St. Casimir's and St. Peter's, that merged in 2003. The former St. Casimir's, founded in 1915 by Lithuanian immigrants, had many memories and old world traditions that folks wanted to preserve. One local author was determined that these strong, so-called ordinary people would not be forgotten. Steve Kiltonic recently spoke with a Springfield woman who wrote about her own family and as well their struggles and dreams for a better life in St. Casimir's children, the Lithuanians of Westfield. Born in Alava, Russia, Kazimieris Metaskevich was 5 feet 8, 175 pounds, when he arrived at Ellis Island in 1888. Here, his birth name was Americanized to Charlie Morris. With his dapper dress and handlebar mustache, Morris could easily be mistaken for the 1930s Mr. Monopoly character, Rich Uncle Pennybags. But Charlie Morris's pockets were surely not overflowing with dollar bills when he came to Westfield that year. Morris would be the first Lithuanian on record to settle in the Whip City. Many more would follow in his footsteps in the decades to come. Morris's granddaughter, Joan Morris Riley, has written a book as a tribute to her father, Benjamin, called St. Casimir's Children, the Lithuanians of Westfield. Riley's first two books focused on the maternal side of her family, whose members lived in the predominantly Irish neighborhood of Hungry Hill in Springfield. Riley is passionate about history and her ancestors. You know, we're talking about ordinary people here. We're not talking about famous people or anything, but just the um, hardships that they went through and the, wow, the caliber of the people is just amazing. For St. Casimir's children, Riley relied mainly on the stories of her father and many aunts and uncles. She spent days searching through the archives of the Westfield Athenaeum and utilized Ancestry.com to locate birth and death certificates. Morris's plan was to find work and earn enough money to go back to his wife Josephine and their farm in Lithuania but he became an American citizen and eventually ended up purchasing a house on Miller Street. Morris found work as a laborer at Westfield's Pulp Manufacturing, where Columbia bicycles were produced. It was hard because there was a language barrier, and so as this little community grew, St. Casimir's Society was the first thing that was formed. The society had strict rules, governing officers, and even its own constitution. The small group of Lithuanians who settled here were determined to build their own church with their own priest. Beginning in 1905, each family contributed 25 cents a month toward that effort. It would take 12 years before they finally realized their dream. Lithuanians would celebrate Mass at Westfield's Trinity Church, which was primarily for the city's Polish. My grandfather and several other of the Lithuanians formed a delegation and went to then Bishop Bevan. and. Um, asked him, they said, we want our own church and we want a Lithuanian-speaking priest. After the group's fourth visit, Bishop Bevan gave his blessing. In 1915, the parish was established and a hall was constructed on William Street, where the Lithuanians could worship, socialize, and hold important events like weddings. Construction began on the church, which eventually cost $30,000. Everybody pitched in. It wasn't a contractor doing it. It was, but then they did all the finish work, the steps, everything. The cornerstone was laid on August 1917. Opening ceremonies took place on May 13, 1918. It was a gala affair with eight uniform societies, bands, and 20 priests. Attending was the parish's first pastor, Father Constantine Vasis, a native Lithuanian. Riley's father was one of the original altar boys. Many societies and social groups formed, including the Knights of Lithuania and the Blessed Virgin Solidarity, whose most important activity was crowning the statue of the Virgin Mary each May. The parish also had a Lithuanian dance group that performed at various events. And there were countless celebrations on holidays as well as for the 50th and 75th anniversaries. Father Vincent Podokas can be seen in many photos. He was the beloved pastor who served the longest 43 years. Riley's grandmother, Josephine, had nine children, but she also lost eight babies. So I found out that I had one aunt and seven uncles who never made it past infancy. A couple of weeks old, a couple of months old. It's funny that it was all things like, you know, that are nothing today, measles, diphtheria. Riley dedicated her book to her grandmother because of her unwavering courage amidst a constant presence of sorrow. But I'm trying to imagine constantly 
getting a baby ready for burial, and then having to go back and do all the work involved with other kids. She didn't have an easy life. Citing changing demographics, the Springfield Diocese closed St. Casimir's in 2003, merging it with St. Peter's, once a Slovak parish. Today it's known as St. Peter and St. Casimir Parish. Here, some of St. Casimir's items can be found, including the statue of St. Casimir and the large cross, which was near the altar. After closing, St. Casimir's was turned into a school for troubled youth for a few years. Now it's used as a storage facility for the city. Over the years, groups like the Knights of Lithuania have kept the traditional Lithuanian customs alive. On a snowy Saturday morning, Lithuanian parishioners are gathered in the parish hall to prepare desru, or Lithuanian sausage, which is an Easter tradition. Jim and Marsha Rogers were both interviewed by Riley for her book. This originally started with some, a ladies' society at St. Casimir's Parish in Westfield, which is, has been closed, and we just felt that we wanted to keep the tradition going, so we've been doing this project for at least 40 years. The secret recipe, consisting of pork, onions, and special spices, are prepared the night before. Marcia is preparing the casings. They're natural casings. Uh, that's all we use. But they have to be rinsed because when we get them, they're packed in heavy salt. An automatic mixer grinds up all the ingredients quickly. Jim then stuffs the sausage. This old machine that we have there came from a market, I think, in East Hampton about 100 years ago, I think but it, it's the best thing that we have. The sausage is then twisted tight, not tied, so it doesn't come apart. The finished product is then weighed and bagged for pickup by parishioners. What makes this Lithuanian sausage different? In the first place, it's not smoked. It's fresh compared to, you know, kielbasa. Um, the spices are much different. Jim says they'll make about 500 pounds of the sausage on this day, about half of what they used to make years ago. The activity is just a lot of fun for the volunteers. It's a pleasure. When they get together, it's a lot of fun, which is nice. With all her books, Riley found similarities in the immigrant experience, whether Lithuanian or Irish. When the Sons of Aaron took over the old St. Casimir's Hall, a plaque was placed in the bar area, symbolizing the brotherhood that bonds all immigrants. Well, I found that they were just ordinary people. The things that seemed to sustain them were faith, family, and America, the promises of America. I'm very glad I did it. I hope my father likes it, <laughs> and I hope he sees it. <laughs> Riley hopes her book inspires others to learn more about their own heritage. For Real to Real, I'm Steve Kiltonic.